Hey, this is Alan over at eglucosaminefordogs.net. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about OCD, or osteochondritis, or as its full medical name, osteochondritis desiccans. What the heck is osteochondritis desiccans anyway? It's a disorder of immature long bones and is seen primarily in humans, horses, and dogs. Due to a variety of circumstances which include diet, trauma, genetics, and body size and weight, growing long bones may develop cracks in the cartilage of the weight-bearing surfaces. Causing severe hip and joint pain is a common effect deriving from OCD. Many dogs develop subsequent inflammation and attempts at healing can lead to scar tissue and calcium deposits in the affected joint. Not a happy situation for a creature who's growing and active. In the x-ray to the left, the scapula can be seen above the head of the humerus, which is the upper arm bone. The rear surface of the humeral head has a pitted area instead of a continuing smooth round surface along the line of the joint. You can see the thin line that is the flap of cartilage which has lifted off the surface of the head of the humerus. We are seeing the circular cartilage flap from the edge so it appears as a thin white line. This particular flap was about the size of a dime. Every time this dog would move the joint or bear weight on it, the flap would irritate the underlying tissue and create pain and discomfort. That's why a dog limps with this condition. Plus, there often is inflammation and nerve irritation simply due to the fact that car the cartilage flap shouldn't be there. This loose object in the joint can float about and creates what's termed as a foreign body reaction. In severe cases, assistance may be necessary to aid the dog with its mobility. Dog wheelchairs, rear support harnesses are several options. There's braces and other options out there, but this happens to be one of the most common. The truth is, there's many theories as to the causes, but since this disorder seems to be spontaneous and not so easy to predict, no one knows for sure why some dogs get OCD and some don't. It's much more prevalent in Golden Retrievers, German Shepherds, Rottweilers, and other large breeds. It is uncommon in the small breeds. Osteochondritis almost always shows up during the growth phase of a young dog's life, usually between 6 to 9 months of age. OCD can affect the shoulder, ankle, or elbow joint. It may start as an intermittent limp in one front leg, or the dog may hold it out, or point the toes away from the midline more than the normal front leg. Many young dogs with osteochondritis will run and play with gusto, but when their activity is slowed, they recall that the limb hurts and then return to favoring the leg. When lying down, they will take care to be gentle with the affected limb. Does diet play a role? Yes, absolutely. Diet plays a major role in everything a dog does or is. An overfed pup who's carrying more weight than optimum has a greater statistical chance of developing osteochondritis than a lean pup. But don't go and underfeed or starve your pup either. This will cause physical, psychological, emotional, and behavioral problems for your dog. Be certain to feed high-quality meat-based diets that do not have grain as their first ingredient. Diets with high protein and fat seem to be a better choice for dogs and cats than those that are high in carbohydrates like corn, wheat, soybean meal. There is a treatment for OCD. One treatment method requires the dog to be confined to a pen for a number of weeks where the activity and jumping will be kept to a minimum. The most direct approach, however, and the one that returns the pup to normal activity the soonest is the surgical approach. Ow. Opening the space between the shoulder and the joint space, the surgeon inspects for any loose cartilage pieces and then rotates the humerus to expose the back side of the head of the humerus where the defect comes into view. Cut. Twist. Look. Ow. Usually the cartilage flap can be grasped with forceps and lifted away from the humerus. Some surgeons gently scrape the bed where the flap was situated in order to stimulate a faster healing time and leave some of the area as it is. The joint is flushed again and closed with sutures. After surgery, rest for a couple of weeks is recommended and then a gradual return to normal activity is encouraged. 
All these treatments are necessary when your canine's joint and mobility problems have exceeded a point where the only option is going to be extreme. These problems that develop in your dog as he grows in weight and age can be corrected early, prevented, and reduced to a fraction of what they can potentially become by simply following some proper nutrition and aiding the joints by giving them their best chance of staying healthy. Your dog's hips and joints are essential components of their mobility makeup, just as your hips, legs, and arms are a part of your mobility makeup. You need to find out the facts on how to treat these things early, how to help prevent them, and how to nourish the joints properly. Stop on by eglucosaminefordogs.net and get your free report on OCD today.